start getting everything lined up. all you guys tuning in right now thanks for tuning in early try to get a little bit of head start get everything get everything lined up right where we want it for today's class early bird catches the worm and all getting everything centered mm -hmm. Casey Mooney? How you doing, Casey Mooney? Calling you out. How you doing today? Hope you're having a wonderful day wherever you are in the world. Tuning in for ciphers and such. This table's so tiny. It's fight. Struggle's real. We'll make it work. And I'll wave at Casey while we're here. Hey, Nathan. I see that. Hey, how's the sound coming through? Nathan, can you hear me nice and clear? Should be all right. Nice presentation. Do a little test run, make sure everything looks good. So I want you guys to be able to see everything that we got going on. Yeah, you can see everything pretty well. All right. Well, if everyone can hear me just fine, and everyone's doing okay, and joining in, tuning in, it's four o'clock on my account. It's time to get into our online camp classroom for today here with South Island YMCA Camps. Uh, today, we're gonna be talking about ciphers and cryptology, which is actually one of my favorites. Uh, I find ciphers to be outstandingly intriguing. That's just a fun way of saying they're cool, all right? So uh, a little bit of history behind ciphers, all right, or cipher wheels, all right, which is a big part of our class today. Um, ciphers and cipher wheels even, you know, these magic decoding items that we use to make sense of our ciphers, uh, dates all the way back to 400 BC. They can find um, examples and representations of ciphers dating all the way back to the ancient Greeks in 400 BC. Um, and they've evolved and come a long way over the years, um, gaining more and more complexity as, uh, as we move through the ages and, you know, made them a little more secure and hard to break, hard to crack, hard to, hard to decode without knowing the, the tricks, so to speak, of everything. Um, for just about every cipher, you have what's known as a pad, all right, um, or a key. And a pad or a key is something you use to actually utilize the cipher. Um, one of the first ciphers we'll talk about is actually what's called an additive cipher, which I can actually show you guys and talk about a little bit using this very basic rudimentary homemade Caesar cipher. Okay, now the Caesar cipher, as you can see, is just a simple, simple little configuration where we have two wheels, both with letters. And they're both, the letters are going the same way. They're going clockwise around the two rings. And one ring is able to spin independently. Um, in the link provided, and we'll probably post a link to it again later when we post this on our, on our website or repost this for viewing, all right? There's a really nice template you can use to make your own cipher at home. It should look something like this guy over here. 
And I really like this template because it gives you these cipher disk options where you can do, you can make um, most of the ciphers we're gonna talk about today using these. Where all you gotta do is cut them out, maybe glue them to some cardboard like I did with this Caesar cipher I made. Um, I just used a, a dowel rod or a peg to put through the center and then super glued some string around it so that they don't fly off and made a nice cipher. And made a nice little build for our cipher. And it's just cardboard, print out paper, you know, all things that we can find around the house. Now, for the Caesar cipher, we can use this to talk about additive ciphers because an additive cipher is, is very straightforward. So if we focus and look at just the outer wheel here, all right, and it's got all the letters of the alphabet represented on it. All right, so an additive cipher would be, in order to figure it out, so in order to encode a message, you would say, say you wanted to spell out the word, um, say my first name, Antonio. All right, so an additive cipher would be, you would find the letter, each letter would get coded in. So for Antonio, my name, you would start with A, and you would add, so say our additive cipher, the key was six plus six. All right, so we would count six over. So one, two, three, four, five, six, so G. So when you're coding the message, you'd write six. So to decode the message, it would be a minus six. So each letter written down in your message to your friend or to your ally or to whoever the receiver intended was supposed to be, they would have a similar ring or a ring in general, or maybe they would just write out the alphabet and they would, okay, I need to decode this G. What does G mean? Okay, well, it's a minus. I know, I know the key is a minus six. Okay, so I got to count one, two, three, four, five, six. That letter is supposed to be A and so on throughout the word or the message you would want to, to encode, okay? So an additive cipher is like the most basic formula uh, or, or form of cipher. And there's, going along with a math theme there, you have uh, multiplicative ciphers where it's a multiplication, so it's like a times, okay, so you have to multiply by a certain number to find where you need to end up on the wheel. Um, or there's an affin cipher, which is a mix of additive and multiplication, either in tandem on each letter, all right, or or even alternating back and forth between. That's an that's an affin cipher. So we've talked about three ciphers already, and we're only, gosh, guys, we're only five minutes in, all right. So and those are the most basic ciphers that you can get, very very standard ciphers that a lot of people get into. It's additive, where your key which is, you know, the trick to finding your letters or your number or to encode or decode is to either add or subtract six. And you could even, using the Caesar cipher, you could use the A as a little arrow. So we gotta find six over. One, two, three, four, five, six. And we know using that A on the inner wheel as our arrow, that G is now the alternate for A. And then say we wanted to go further, so we would find N. So we turn, all right, we gotta find six over. So one, two, three, four, five, six. All right, so N would actually be written down as T, all right? So it all depends on how you use it. Now the true use for the Caesar cipher, all right? And the Caesar cipher was used for a long time. Uh, it's called a Caesar cipher because it dates back to ancient Rome, all right? But it also has a, a secondary name because of another popular time in history that a Caesar cipher was utilized. And that's actually during the American Civil War. Um, the Confederate Army, as well as the Union Army, each had a cipher that they used for encrypting messages back and forth um, amongst, you know, their military forces. All right. The Union Army one, I don't have a representation with me here in hand today, but was genuinely, it was a more complicated, modernized for its time version of a cipher. Okay, the Confederate cipher was a little more simplistic. One of the beauties of ciphers and using cipher wheels, or as a lot, what a lot of people call them, uh, a nickname for them is a whiz wheel, because you whiz right through it, all right, it spins. All right, when you're using a cipher or a whiz wheel, it's pretty easy to teach someone how to utilize it, all right? Yeah, they, I think you know, they were a lot of times saying they could teach uh, an entry level person how to use one of these uh, very proficiently within like five minutes. Um, now the Confederate cipher was sim more similar, just about essentially the same as a Caesar cipher. 
And how it worked was your key was a special code word, okay? So for example, all right, a code word I'll use, and I'll, I'll lift this up and show you guys afterwards. Let's come up with a message, okay? What's a, what's a wartime message that we want to put out, okay? So we want to tell them, and, and, and you got to think about it. You, know, you, you, don't want, you want something quick. Maybe, maybe you have to send this message out quickly, and they need to be able to decode it quickly so they can respond or react to it. All right, so maybe we want to put um, meet at dawn. All right, so we want to meet at dawn. Dawn is the time to meet, okay? So our code, all right, our key that we want to use, okay, for example, you know, we obviously don't want anyone breaking this message too early. Um, so a popular one back in the, you know, the days when they were using the Confederate cipher was just the word Confederate, okay? So how we get to that, all right, let's say Confederate. So C O N. See if I spelled it right. Now, and it's actually kind of fun. So sometimes maybe the code word would be a specific word, but they'd spell it wrong on purpose or they put some extra letters in there. So we're gonna do Confederate how we spell it here. All right, C O N F E D E R A T E. Okay, so we need to break that down. So how to use this, the first thing you want to do is you take your message, which meet at dawn, you want to break it into four letter groups, which is pretty easy with meet at dawn because we got M. E, E, T for meet. We got A, T for at, and we'll add the D, A for it from Don. And then we'll make a two letter group at the end that's just W, N. All right. And then we're going to line up underneath it our code, our keyword, which is Confederate. So C, O, N, F, conf. All right. E, D, E, R, all right, and then we have an A, T. We have an extra E at the end, we don't have to use it. We got an extra space. Maybe you want to put, if you had a more complex site for maybe put an exclamation marker or something, but we're not going to. All right, so now using our Caesar cipher, all right, you're gonna again, you're gonna use the outer wheel and the inner wheel together. So how it works is your inner wheel is going to be your key, which for us is the word Confederate. Our outer wheel, our outer wheel is going to be our message that we're coding in. Okay, and then remember we have that A. All right, or correction. I'm saying this all backwards today. I must be flustered. All right, our inner wheel is the message. Our outer wheel is the key. The out and um, our inner wheel A acts as our arrow for alignment, okay? So if we use the A for our alignment, we wanna spell, using the outer wheel, we're gonna spell our key out. So to spell it out, we're gonna start with a C. All right, so we start with a C, A's lined up with C, and our actual message, which we're gonna find and spell out as we go on the inner wheel, we have an M. All right, well, if C lines up with A, is lined up with A to start spelling Confederate, M lines up with O. So we write it down. All right, so our next word. Oh, well, we got to bring O all the way over here to A. All right, so we brought the A over to O. And where did E end up? E ended up with an S. All right, now we want to bring the A over to N, so just one over. And where did E end up? It ended up at R. All right, so now we're gonna bring the A over to F, Confederate, because we're spelling out Confederate here. A's lined up with F. Okay, so where'd that T end up? T's right here next to Y. All right. And we'd go, and we're gonna work our way through it. You'd work your way through it to spell out all the way through Confederate, through your message, until you had what looked like a jumble of letters. Okay, and that's your encoded message. And then that you would send to your friend your friend hopefully having also a Caesar cipher, all right, and knowing the key or the keyword, which would be Confederate in this case. 
All right, so if we work our way through it, we'll end up E again with our A. All right, we're looking where the A end up. Oh, end up at E. All right. And then we do the same for T again, but notice if you have repeat letters, uh, do you think it's gonna be the same? No, because Confederate, different letters. Okay, so this time we're gonna line A up with D. All right, and where's T at? Here at W. All right. So we're gonna line up with E again. Where's D now? H. And you're gonna work your way all the way through the word and it gives you obviously encoded message. And that's again something, you know, after you encode it, roll it up, however you're gonna send it, pass it along to your friend, your ally, uh, whoever's gonna be decoding this and utilizing the information. And it's gonna give them a nice secret message. And they would just work backwards in order to in order to figure out what the message was. So they would write out the hidden message. They would write in the, its groups of four. They'd write out Confederate underneath it in groups of four, and they'd work their way. You do the opposite. You're working your way backwards using the wheel to figure out what the message was. And it was a pretty clever way to hide and uh, to you know to hide messages and transfer them out so that their enemies or people that didn't want to be in the know uh, could get the information out. All right. So that's your Caesar cipher. And again, uh, we'll be posting a template, or if. If that's not soon enough for you, there's lots of templates out there online for the Caesar cipher as well as this next cipher wheel that we're going to talk about. Okay. Now, the next wheel I want to talk about, all right, this is the Mexican Army cipher. I actually have a very nice replica of it um, because I, I'm, I'm a cipher nerd. I can't help it. I think it's a very intriguing piece of history to look at. Now, the Mexican Army Cipher was very popular and actually utilized in the late 1800s all the way up to World War I. Um, and what makes it so powerful is it's got, let's see here, one, two, three, four, five wheels. All right. And each wheel, okay, each one of these wheels has 26 characters on it. The bottom wheel, the main wheel has letters. And then each of the four stacking wheels moving up are numbers all the way up to 100. Notice there's some blank spaces here on this tiny wheel, if you guys can see that, okay? Now, the key for these guys, you would typically find a key to a particular letter. And again, a, you know, a popular way of explaining this is using the letter A, okay? And you could do it a couple different ways. Um, some ways I was playing around with was you could line it all up underneath the letter A for a particular configuration. So if I put it just like that, my, my key for deciphering or ciphering thing or encoding things would be A21317686. All right, and that's very important to know or to make sure it gets translated over to uh, whoever's gonna be decoding this message intentionally so that they can actually decode it properly because with all these numbers and these letters, put the power put together and all the configurations possible, all right, there are over three hundred thousand configurations all right three over three hundred thousand uh possibilities for how this could be set and what it's going to tell you or what it's going to actually translate things into all right the other cool feature on this so let's say i did um we'll do a3 do, do, do. turns all the way around so we'll do a3 We'll do this wheel, we'll put you at 27. Let's see if I remember in this right. Now you to 27, we're gonna set you to 53. All right, and we're gonna set this top guy, we're gonna set this top guy to 79. All right, now this is something I was playing around with earlier where I have it set where in alignment with the A, we have three, 27, 53, and 79. But how it also works out, I thought this was really clever of me. Another way to look at how you would maybe read your key is in a four letter code. Um, in this case, it's YMCA. So the Y is zero one, which is the lowest number on this bottom ring. All right, the M is 39. All right, it would be a way to spell out everything. 
Um, and then as well as C, C ended up 55, 81. Let's see if we did that right. 27, 53, 79. Yeah. All right, and I can see why, you know, so you could spell it YMCA, a certain way to look at it, okay? Um, you can also use, you know, Tony, T-O-N-Y, spell it out a certain way. Either way, the biggest deal with it, with all of these whiz wheels, these code, these, uh, these wheels is, make sure that whoever is receiving the message knows what the key is to decode it. And the key in this case, as I've just said it, is A03, 27, 53, and 79. So now what you do, you have the wheel set, okay, is you'd go through and say we had our meet at dawn message. Okay, we're gonna go back to that. So meet at dawn, again, I would put it into, I could put it into three letter or two letter or four letter groups. So maybe uh, this time I'll put it into three letter groups. Me, tat, da. What are we doing? Da, and then you have N by itself at the end. Okay, and what I do is I go around, so for M, I gotta make M something. So I now have four options, because these four tiers by everything, I have four options of a number I can put down. So maybe for me, meet at dawn, in this case, using the key of A3275379, maybe I'll put in 39, and then you dash it, because you gotta put a dash so they can tell all the numbers apart. Alright, unless you put unless you again, unless you work it out ahead of time where everything's in double digit, you know, 08 for 8, 32 for 32, you know. And then for E, so I have four options. I can put E down at 07, 31, 57, 83. So let's say we put that as 57. I have a second E. Oh, well, I could repeat and put a 57, but as far as code breaking, that makes it a little easy. Using this. Put that second E is zero seven. All right, and then I just keep dashing through. So T, oh, we gotta do a T. Okay, well T, I got twenty-two, forty-six, seventy-two, ninety-eight. Let's do ninety-eight. And then for A, let's put a fifty-three. And then for that second T, I can put ninety-eight. Oh, I use ninety-eight for a T already. Don't want to repeat. Nah, we don't want to repeat. That's too easy. We'll put a twenty-two. All right, and we'll put a D. D will use 56. We got a second A here. What did I already use for A? Well, let's use something different. Let's use 28. Well, that's a B. I have to use 27. Because you got to make sure you're paying attention on the on the Mexican Army cipher. Once you set it, you got to make sure it doesn't move and that you're paying attention, constantly rechecking your key at A or whatever letter you use to make sure that it's staying in line. All right, so we got the W, W, let's put a 75 for W. And then for that N, for that N, let's put 40. All right, so in the end of the day, meet at dawn ends up turning into a string of double digit letters or double digit numbers, my bad. All right, and that's really hard to decipher back into the message. Again, unless you happen to have the same type of uh, encryption wheel and know the key to encrypt it, okay? It's all about creating that intrigue. <laughs> All right, so that basically covers our Mexican army cipher. All right, and again, using the template that I have over here, um, which you can easily find online or you know, we'll be able to post later on down the road. Um, using this template, some cardboard, glue, and a pair of scissors and a pen to write in the numbers or letters or however you want to configure it, you can make one of these in your own front room, okay? It's a very cool little tool. All right, so we'll move along. So we talked about the old Mexican cipher. We talked about the Caesar cipher that got reused by the Confederates. Now we're going to talk about a very, very cool cipher. All right, and this is called the Diana Crypto System. Okay, and Diana Crypto System. What I find very intriguing about this, okay, is it's a it's what's considered a one-time pad encryption system. And it was used by U.S. Army Special Forces uh, during the Vietnam era. All right, so this was it wasn't that long ago that this little guy was in the hands of you know U.S. GIs. Not this one in particular, you know, it's you know, it's it's relation was in the hands of U.S. GIs um, encrypting and sending messages over radios um, because you know during World War II they had the the infamous Enigma machine that got that the Germans used that we had that the British were able to break. There's a movie about it. You can check it out. It's very cool. All right. Um, 
but they needed something that they could that was simpler that they could put in the hands of of the common soldier he'd be able to use it to encode and decode messages and make it all work now the key to this guy's success because obviously in comparison you know much simpler it's only, you know, it's only two wheels right much simpler than the mexican army cipher much simpler all right now what makes it interesting is there's there's three wheels on it technically there's only one that moves but inside you see here there's a sight window and inside the sight window there's another wheel of letters what also makes this interesting is you'll notice that the outer wheel is a b c d e f g going this way this inner wheel is a b c d e f g going this way and then the window wheel is a b c d e f g it's going the same way as the spinning wheel okay so that that adds some variables that make it hard to just solve with an equation so to speak all right for you math wizards out there there's a lot you know we're we're doing the basics here you know so there's a lot more you can look up and go out and explore on youtube and online um to learn about not only the you know the diana diana mexican army and caesar ciphers but also many other ciphers that are out there and popular uh amongst people you know collectors or just people that enjoy it all right now how this works is like i said they would use a one-time pad all right so when you were given this they'd have these booklets that would come out with them and each page was a different pad now what what's a pad right okay well i'll tell you all right so a pad or the key that you're using so to speak a pad was a jumble of letters randomly generated completely randomly generated all right so with it you'd send this send your message out and with it you'd also send out what you know which pad was being used but after they used that pad it was discarded, all right? It was completely, it was never used again, never even touched or thought about again. They were constantly cycling new pads for everyone to potentially utilize. And once they got used up, it was discarded and never used again. All right, these pads would be crazy big. I think I have a representation over here. Oop, that's my cigar. All right, so a pad might look like this. All right, it's just a collection of letters, all in groups of four or five, depending on the pad you're using. All right, and you would encode your message off of this pad. All right, so instead of going through a processing back and forth like you do with the Caesar cipher, every single letter, you know, you might have repeat letters, but they're being synchronized with a different letter be dependent on where it falls along the course of the pad as you process through which greatly locks in and secures what your message, whatever it may be, you know, how hard is to, you know, for someone who you don't want to read it to see it. All right. And so you'd use a pad, that pre-issued pad, whatever it may be, and you'd go through and out here, something I really like about uh, the manufacturers. So these were all, these, these wooden ciphers that I have were all made by, um, Creative Craft House, which is a company in Florida that does a lot of woodworking. Uh, they make tools and ciphers and all sorts of uh, props and magician props and stuff like that. So it's a fun little resource. All right. But uh, so how this works and what I like about it is they did burn onto here the actual, you know, the order of operations. So you have your outer wheel, which is the key letter. Okay. And the key would be coming off of that pad. All right. So say the key letter was L. All right. You have your inner wheel which is the message text. So the actual letter from your message would be aligned from this inner wheel. And the window is the coded letter, okay? Which is pretty nifty, all right? So let's say I went off of this pad, this, you know, suggested pad that we have, okay? So I got J-U-H-O-C-B-D-O-Q-Z X, K, J, R, M. Again, it's all, it's random gibberish. Like, there's literally no rhyme or reason to the pads that were generated for the Deanna site, the crypto system. All right. So let's say we went off that. And again, we're just doing meet at dawn, our original message. Meet at dawn. Okay. So we want to do meet at dawn. We'll do it right here below the Mexican, Mexican army cipher, the Mac as we'll call it. All right. So this is the Diana cipher. All right, so we want to encrypt this. So we're going to use this this pad text that we have. So 
Remember the key letter of the pad is on the outer ring, so that first letter is J. We want to line up with M, which was from our message. And then whatever pops up, we got an E in our window. I don't know if you guys can see that, but it gives us an E. Okay. And we want to do the next letter in our message is an E, but we're going to use U. All right. So we're going to use U on the outer wheel. We're going to use E on the inner wheel. And it gives us a B in our window. All right. And already you can see, you know, it's giving, it's, it's jumbling it. All right, now we have a second E in a row because of meat, right? Well, that's what makes the Diana Scythe uh, crypto system so great because now we're using an H. All right, so we want to align that E up with an H, and it's going to give us an O in our window. All right, and again, you just keep going through that, doing your order of operations, repeat, 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 until you work your way all the way through the system, through your through your message, and then when you send that to your friend, you'd make sure that they knew what pad you used to encode it so they could backtrace your work, work backwards, and recreate the message and know what, what you're trying to tell them so that they can meet you at dawn. All right, another cool thing about the Diana crypto system, because it was sent out over radio waves, this is something they transmitted, was they actually had passwords that they would use, all right? So me and they would have encoding message, okay? So like at the end of every message, they would encode into the message EOM. In this order, they would encode EO, the letters EOM, which stood for end of message. They would encode ACK, which stood for acknowledge. And then they would encode the initials of whoever was sending the message. So you would know that that was the end of the message, that they were looking for acknowledgement, they needed you to, to say something back, they needed a response on whatever they had sent you, it might have been a question, and then the initials of who sent it to you, so you knew how to look them up and uh, reach out directly to them to send that message back, whatever their call sign might have been officially, all right? And they would send these messages over the radio through a readout using the phonetic alphabet, or they'd send it through Morse code. Um, it really just depended on what they had available to them. Okay, so that goes over, that, that's pretty much everything. You know, we talked about our Caesar cipher, we talked about the Mexican army cipher, our uh, Deanna crypto system, Diana, Deanna, so many ways you can pronounce that. All right, we talked about a little bit of history with them, where they all come from, why they're so much fun. Um, and the last thing I wanted to talk about is unsolved ciphers. So out in history, and you can look these up, there's a lot of them. Actually, I wrote down a couple infamous ones just so I wouldn't, forget but out in history there are actual ciphers um, or encrypted messages that have been found over the many many years that to this day have not been solved all right they're still out and unknown all right some of those uh to name a few that are the more intriguing ones um you have the dorabella from 1897 the dorabella encryption you have the beale papers from 1885 1885, these papers have been, float, have been known about since 1885. We still don't know what there is, what they have to tell us. And some people write that off as it's probably just gibberish or it doesn't make any sense to anyone. Um, but based off of basic, uh, based off of the studying of them and looking at the layout of them, we know that they are encryptions. All right. Uh, the Ricky McCormick notes of 1999, that's pretty recent. Uh, the Voynich manuscript. From the 15th century, Voynich manuscript from the 15th century, uh, the linear A from the 18th century, or ancient, ancient Crete, and many more. All right, there are a lot of ciphers out there, and you can look them up online. Um, if this is something that you're really interested in, maybe a hobby, it is a fun way to communicate with friends or to send messages back and forth. Um, whether it's a plain text shorthand cipher or a more complicated wheel-oriented cipher. Remember, we talked about those plain text types of ciphers, the additive, multiplicative, and affin ciphers, um, or a polyalphabetic cipher. If you're interested in those, they're fun to look up and look into. They can get pretty tricky. And again, these were just the basics, all right? There's much, much more out there that you can really explore and get into as far as uh, lateral shift and all sorts of other cool concepts um, that are within the world of ciphers and cryptography okay um so i hope you guys really enjoyed the video 
If you're watching this on YouTube, make sure to you know hit that like and subscribe, and uh, check out down in the com uh, you know leave a comment, leave a positive something, all right, uh, and even check out in the bottom, uh, you know check out in the uh, description section um, if you have anything, uh, if you're interested in donating to the greater good, helping camp out any way, shape, or form, you know click on that donate button. I hope everyone stays healthy and is having a wonderful day and they uh, enjoyed today's class on uh, ciphers and cryptology.